a lot of work I'd originally started when I was at DFO Newfoundland, and I've been continuing now in Concordia um, with a team of researchers. So looking at trying to understand spatial patterns of productivity um, or mapping vulnerability as productivity and trying to understand drivers, spatial temporal drivers of productivity, um, of especially of um, invertebrate stocks like shrimp, like northern shrimp. And you know, just in interest of time, I'd quickly say my my thank yous to the, a lot of people who've given feedback on this. So Crystal Baker, Catherine Skeens, Mariano Cohen Alonzo, Jeff Evans, and Adam Cook, all from DFO, uh, David Delorier and Ora Beria Aurelia from um, University of Quebec Rimouski, and my own lab, so Valentin Lucet and Fania Irvin, Irvin um, have both um, been actively contributing to this and working on developing this material. Uh, and this is funded through NSERC um, and through Fisheries and Oceans Canada through the Sustainable Fisheries Science Fund, as well as when I was working at, D at DFO. So when asking what determines vulnerability of fish stocks, we need to look at not just total biomass of the stock, but also how it's changing over time. For instance, if we compared two stocks here, so this red stock on the left and the blue stock on the right, if we looked at just the, the biomass of the stock, so how, how abundant they are at a particular point in time, we might think that this blue stock is, is less vulnerable, it's, it's more resilient over a period, just because it's higher abundance in the ecosystem. However, if we want to actually assess how vulnerable the stocks are to, um, um, to drivers, what we really need to look at is how does the stock recover following a disturbance? How quickly can it regrow back? Because if we get a pattern of say multiple disturbances affecting a system, and as we know, we're, we're increasing environmental pressures on ecosystems, we expect to see stocks that are able to bounce back rapidly, like the one on the left, so have a rapid rate of increase, will be able to weather and recover more quickly from multiple perturbations, and are likely to be able to resist for a longer period of time constant pressures. Where stocks like the one on the right, even though it had a high abundance initially, following the deter disturbance here, it shows a low pattern of recovery. So it's not rapidly coming back to where it was. But we want to determine how resilient a stock is. We can't just look at the stock stats. We can't look at how abundant it is or how abundant something is in, in nature. We need to try to determine how quickly it can recover. And this recovery is determined by its maximum per capita productivity. So how many new individuals each individual can produce at its maximum? Typically, this is at you know, the lowest point of the stock, where the stock is, is very near bottom, how quickly it can recover. But this per capita productivity maximum might also occur at, you know, if there's a transition in the ecosystem, there might be a point where if we drive it too low, um, it can recover if it's driven to a certain point, but if it's driven too low that it will go through regime shift and collapse to a different state. So we need to determine how um, productivity what varies uh, with stock status and also what the maximum is. So we know that stock productivity can vary dramatically over time, though. In fisheries, we've typically have assumed that productivity, so the amount of so natural mortality or, or um, uh, mortality due to predation, has stayed constant. And we typically assume, and this is the basis of a lot of our static maximum sustainable yield models. When we look at actual many stocks over the last several years, we see that there's can be very large swings in stock productivity. So this is um, a time series extrapolated from um, diet information for northern shrimp. So northern shrimp are spread out uh, they're, they're across um, waters from Europe to, to North America, um, but they're especially they have a very high abundance in the, the wa waters of Newfoundland, so around Newfoundland and Labrador. So especially in, in shrimp fishing areas four, five, and six here, with a more marginal stock in area seven. Um, but this stock was not nearly as abundant as it is now. And based on diet information, so based on inferences we made from diet, we found that if we looked at the level around 1980 to 1990, prior to the collapse of cod, we marked that index as one. We see that following the collapse of cod, we actually saw these shrimp stocks increase somewhere between five and ten times of where they were previously in only a course of a couple of years. And then around about 2008 to 2010, which also corresponded with the partial increase of cod again on the Newfoundland shelf, we saw this stock collapse rapidly. So we saw a period where this stock increased rapidly in productivity, so increasing massively in population size, before collapsing back down again. And we think back down to levels that were near where they were in the 1990s. Now, if we want to look at what determines 
productivity, and which which in turn determines resilience. Was that the higher the productivity, the the more the higher the potential productivity, the more resilient the stock will be to external perturbations. We know that it's determined not only by human factors like fishing, but also by abiotic and um, and biotic factors. So stock productivity, where here we're describing stock productivity is biomass in year T plus the catch in year T divided by biomass in T minus one. Now this is the, the per unit biomass productivity of the stock. This will be affected by not only temp uh, climate factors like temperature, um, but it'll also be factor affected by factors like how abundant its predators are and how abundant its prey are. So we often focus on, we, we focus on uh, vulnerability assessments or trying to measure how climate change might affect species. We often focus on the direct effects of things like temperature on um, on things like growth rate or on things like abundance. But a lot of work, you know, a lot of this being led by Eric Post, um, but you know, more and more we're frequently seeing work that indicates that um, these other factors can have as large or, or larger effect on growth rates as uh, climate itself. And the indirect effects of climate on things like predator density or prey availability can actually have a in, can have larger overall effects on production than the direct effects of climate itself. So if we want to model and understand drivers of productivity, we need to look at not only these abiotic factors, but also how they're affecting intermediate variables like predator density. And also, if we want to predict vulnerable, like what stocks are vulnerable, we need spatially explicit measures of productivity. So fishery science is typically focused on single stock models where we assume the stock is well mixed. However, two stocks that have the same average productivity across the area will have radically different responses to environmental change depending on if they have spatially structured areas of high and low productivity versus roughly the same average productivity across the whole landscape. So for instance, the landscape on the left here where there's large areas of, of low productivity, but a few areas that are responsible for high amounts of productivity are going to be much more vulnerable to any changes that are occurring in these high productivity hotspots than this low vulnerability landscape. Although this landscape on the right might be more vulnerable to say average change across the whole region. So um, this is a point I think Dan Boyce was making in an earlier NavHub talk about the importance of trying to model not only um, vulnerability at a, a large scale, but also vulnerability, especially explicit measures of vulnerability. So what we've been working on is trying to build spatial temporal models of varying drivers of productivity in northern shrimp. So trying to understand how different components of the ecosystem that we can measure affect how productive these, uh, these northern shrimp stocks are. Um, so northern shrimp are driven not only by fishing pressure, but they're driven by things like um, plankton abundance, um, as well as predation availability, and all of these are in turn being driven by temperature. Uh, and so the, the results I'm showing after this are, are work from DFO, but this work is being continuously developed now by Valentin Lucet, who's currently developing a package based on this, uh, which we hope to make uh, publicly available in the next few months. Uh, and Fanny Irvin, who's um, working on developing this model to, apl to apply it to the Scotian shelf. So our method for this model is to try to build a spatially explicit model of productivity. So what we've done is we've broken this larger region down into many different patches where the patches are scaled or picked based on trying to map, capture areas that are geographically similar, so have similar depths um, are compact. So each patch is uh, a compact area and represents sampling density. So areas where we have higher sampling intensity, we have more patches because we're able to more explicitly model this. And this is sampling intensity from the, the RV Charles survey. And then for this, what we can do is we can spatially smooth our predictors. So on the right here, we show spatial smooths for cod density across these regions. And we can use these spatially smooth predictors of, of cod density and biomass to infer how, bio, how productivity is varying in each individual patch. And you can see how the, the spatial temporal pattern of this driver is changing. So for instance, in 2006, we had very low density everywhere of cod. Whereas in 2014, we now have a substantially increased density of cod, but especially in these more offshore areas and a weak, a smaller amount of increase in the inshore. So we're looking for how cod might be affecting productivity. We need to look at not only how it's changed in total abundance, but also where it's uh, where locations of, of cod hotspots have shifted. So 
What we've done is we've modeled local productivity in each of these patches. So you can see product patches, um, so V42 all the way to V59 here with time series of productivity. Um, and we've modeled them as, as a product of local density, um, ABI, like a, a maximum growth rate in a given area, predator density, and temperature. And we're able to pretty successfully model, so this bottom plot shows observed productivity, so how productive each patch is, versus predicted productivity from the model. We're able to pretty effectively capture these overall product, uh, productivity trends. And this also lets us highlight areas of productivity hotspots. So because we're modeling this spatially explicitly, we can find areas that are on average have very high productivity versus areas that have low productivity. And this is separate from areas that have high or low average biomass. So for instance, if we model this as, as a, a spatial field, so a spatially smooth field, we find that there are areas of, of high productivity here around 56 latitude. Um, and whereas if we look at say SFA6, which is over here, it has um, somewhat higher productivity overall, but it's more spatially spread out. So there's not a single hot spot the way there is in SFA5, which implies in turn implies that we should be, you know, maybe more concerned about variation affecting or factors affecting uh, in the environment in these locations because these act as such a major hot spot of productivity for this whole region. So just to summarize overall, so to understand vulnerability, we need to know how maximum growth rates vary with the environment. It's not enough to know where we find or don't find a species or how abundant they are in the location. We need to know how responsive their growth rates are to environmental change. We know that growth rates depend on both abiotic and biotic conditions. So we want to model vulnerability effectively. We need to model these direct and indirect effects of things like climate change on growth rates. And then finally, these spatially explicit modeling of productivity lets us identify potential hotspots that we might need to protect over time. So thank you for your time. I, I appreciate the chance to give a talk and I'm happy to answer any questions. Hey, thank you so much, Eric.